Um, yeah, so for the people who haven't seen this, um, I'm just going to give a bit of a quick history of what I did over lockdown, which is make this crazy book. Um, what my intention was with it, um, sort of my interests and my artistic trajectory led me to make this, but also um, my views on paleo art and what can be done with it in the world. And um, so this is this is sort of my attempt at um, provoking some thought about this as also, and also making uh, a nice looking book, um, coffee table book that people can browse through and hopefully be amused by. Um, so what I actually start with is the history of art, strangely enough, um, which is familiar to a lot of people. Uh, a lot of the history of art is of Western painting, I should say, and and yeah, let's backtrack a little bit. Uh, a lot of what I say history of art is more Western painting, the sort of painting I grew up copying, emulating. It's how I learned to paint. Um, so yeah, that what I what I'm talking about here is is a particular stream of Western painting. Obviously, there's a hell of a lot more art than this in the world. Um, but yeah, so the story of Western painting is often given and to a large extent, it's true, is a history of style. We start with pretty mannered, um, slightly abstracted art in the Middle Ages. Um, it becomes gradually more naturalistic in the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, right up until the middle of the 1800s when photography, I think, does have an impact on painting and painting goes back to being um, stylized, abstracted, and you get a huge explosion of um, mixing styles and ex exploration of the stylistic space that continues at a cracking pace for about a hundred years um, in all directions. And in some directions, like minimalism, you actually reach the end of the stylistic space. There's there's nowhere to go, and I think this is actually true of a lot of Western painting. There's 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 not really anywhere to go anymore. The the stylistic space is explored, um, which is relevant to what I'm going to talk about a bit later. The other aspect of Western painting is the um, the subject matter. Uh, so you have a tremendous variety of styles, but interestingly, you don't have a huge variety of subject matter. Um, you've got, as I say, sexy Jesus, sexy, sexy baby, sexy ladies, um, landscapes, and some scenes of everyday life creep in uh, later on in the history. But there's a huge amount missing here. And if you, especially if you look at the later parts of painting, I'm talking about 1800s onwards, it's really quite surprising. There is virtually no reaction to our increased understanding of the world. This is when we discovered, um, you know, the expanse of space, the deep history of the world, the um, prehistory, I should say, the the microscopic, huge amounts of new visual, the new visual world that, that science can bring, the, bring to painting is basically ignored by, well, certainly the really well-known Western painters. Um, there's just not really anything there. Uh, someone at Tetsukon was telling me there might be a plesiosaur in a Turner painting. And it's it's very faint. Is it a plesiosaur? Probably, but you know, um, I think that's pretty much it. So, <laughs> in terms of the main canon of Western art, there is no reaction to the explosion of scientific understanding, which I find rather extraordinary. Um, so yes, they're missing things like sauropod dinosaurs, which are obviously the best subject matter there is in the world. Um, why they ignored this stuff, I don't know. So my thoughts about what paleo art can bring to the art world 
is a tremendous and deep appreciation of this new subject matter. You know, we're not, this is a, um, our understanding of prehistoric animals is of course very uncertain, but it comes with a tremendous depth of knowledge and appreciation for how we can explore the space of how to depict these animals. They've, there's intersection with science, art, philosophy, how we depict uncertainty. This is tremendously deep um, and interesting subject matter and philosophical thought, I think, to bring to the broader world of art. So I think paleo art has a tremendous amount to offer the broader world of art. And I think if we want a historical analogy, um, the Renaissance painters were obsessed with anatomy. This was what made their paintings and their sculptures look different um, from the medieval stuff that preceded. They, they were really interested in the reality of how bodies work. And that has been rather lost in the stylistic exploration that has come since. But paleo art is, again, really interested in this, just with a much broader uh, broader remit. Um, so in my typical fashion of just jamming things together, I thought, well, why not just jam historical art, the kind of Western canon that I'm familiar with, with paleo art? So that's what I've done for this book. But there were a couple of rules. I didn't really want to produce this sort of thing. Dinosaurs in clothes, artificial mixed with naturalistic. So not this sort of thing, although I do this, is not in the book. I, I wanted to cr create a book because what if the great painters of history had painted paleo art? Not just if they'd jammed dinosaurs in the pictures, but if there'd been genuine attempts at paleo art, engaging in the world as we came to understand it. So yeah, it's not a history of painting with dinosaurs doing people things. Uh, it is a history of painting as if they had had a modern understanding of dinosaurs. I didn't go back and try and retrofit what a medieval painter would have thought about dinosaurs because the, it's, it's incoherent. Um, it would have been a much shorter book of shorter paintings. And I was interested in the old styles, right? I, I wanted to, I wanted to include some late medieval Renaissance art, Enlightenment art, where there was, wasn't really a coherent idea of what dinosaurs or prehistoric animals look like. Um, so uh, the rest of the talk here is my is just pictures from the book. And I'm going to differ from my normal talk here, where I would talk about whether these were successful as art um, and actually talk about the process of making them a little bit. Uh, because I think that's going to be relevant to what I'm going to bring up at the end. Okay, so this is um, a painting originally by Uccello. Uh, I've gone, it's a battle scene, knights in shining armor, that sort of thing. Um, it's one of these early Renaissance paintings, which is very stylized. Um, you can see the perspective and all these things is really uh, odd to our modern eyes. Uh, this painting, I used the original painting as a base and I painted over the top of it. Um, it's got parts of the original painting in it, but I really had to do an extensive modification to remove anything that looked artificial in it. Obviously, there's <laughs> armor. In the background, there's plowed fields and things like that, so I, I removed all that. But this does have original parts of the painting in it. It's, uh, it's basically in a very extensive Photoshop job. Um, similarly for this one, uh, I realized quite early on in painting for this book that if I wanted to get it out within a year or two, I could not paint everything from scratch and I needed to use the original paintings. Um, this is a painting, it's a hunting scene by, originally a hunting scene by um, Lucas Cranich the Elder. I've basically gone and taken out all the people and the animals that are hunting, replace them with dinosaurs. Um, the trees and so on, are, I didn't paint. They are the original painting. I've moved some things around but to cover things. But um, yeah, this is another extensive Photoshop job. The 
the skill in this, I guess, is painting the dinosaurs to match the style of the original painting. Um, this is another Photoshop job, which I felt a bit guilty by because this is definitely something I could have produced quickly. But there you go. Um, it's a painting by Delacroix. I've essentially taken the horse, turned it into a therizinosaur. This is a painting by Corot. Um, I have. It, this contains several elements of an original painting, but I have extensively modified and repainted other parts. So it's not really identifiable as a specific painting, um, but it does include original painting by Carew. Um, often I needed to change plants to match Mesozoic times rather than modern times, things like that. Um, obviously the dinosaurs as well. Uh, this is a Monet and a Mary Cassatt, both Impressionists, obviously. I did use a base for the Monet painting. I used the original Monet painting. Um, I did modify lots of parts of it. The Mary Cassatt is virtually from scratch. Impressionists didn't turn out as well as I thought they would. Um, I think they're okay paintings, but they're not as interesting as I hoped. This was one of the paintings that I started with. It was one of my first paintings I did for the book. And it was the one that I decided was, had told me that I was probably going to have to use extensive Photoshopery. This is a, this is painted from scratch. It's a Klimt. Um, there's no original painting in here. This is all me. Uh, it took forever. I was really expecting Klimt to be a painter right in my wheelhouse. I thought that I would be able to produce them quickly. It took forever getting the, the paint and the brush strokes to look right, getting the colors to look right. Took a long time. And this was went to be a relatively simple one. And I thought, oh, <laughs> this book is going to take me years if I'm trying to forge all these paintings. Even digitally, this takes a while. I'm I'm happy with this one. I think it looks like a Klimt. I'm very happy with the forgery, but yes, it told me that I was going to take a long time if I was going to produce all the pictures like this. Uh, this is a Metzinger. This is a painting from scratch as well. Uh, Kandinsky. It's a, a Quetzalcoatlus. This is also created from scratch. As we get later on, paintings become a lot simpler and easy for me to fake from scratch, which I would just do. So, yeah. And this is uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, again, from scratch. Obviously, a lot of these paintings, as I say, are pretty simple. So it was feasible for me to do these from scratch and look very much like the, um, the original artists. Yes. So, um, again, Mostly from scratch. There are some original paint bits in this in places. I always, I with things like this, I would often use a template, but obviously in something like this, the amount of work to turn it from a portrait into an animal, you're basically going to be painting the whole thing again, which I, which I did. Um, this sort of thing would take me at least a few days to get right. There's, um, I should have mentioned there's there's over 50 pictures in the book, so it took a it took a long time. Even taking a few days, it it took a long time to finish the book, obviously. And I didn't work on this exclusively. I, was, I had other work. I continued to paint other pictures. So yeah, this is why I had to switch in the really complicated ones to Photoshop bodging. Um, this is uh, Francis Bacon. This is from scratch. Uh, Jackson Pollock, um, again from scratch, the interleaving of um, the paint, which Jackson Pollock does, meant that I couldn't really take an existing one and try and put these ghostly, ghostly sauropods in. I, I had to do it from scratch. Um, Things like this actually take a surprisingly a surprising amount of time. It looks like scribbling. It is scribbling, um, but often you find you do 
a lot of scribbling and it just doesn't look right. It looks awful or it just doesn't look like the original way of scribbling. And so I had to train myself to do the right sort of scribbling. If I was forging this for real, I'd use do how Jackson Pollock did, which was laying it on the floor and throwing paint on the ground. But I wasn't doing that. I was just doing it with a brush, well, in Photoshop, um, which obviously is quite different. So learning the technique of how to, how to do this and make it look like Jackson Pollock's splatters was actually a little challenging. And uh, it took me a few days just to get my eye in. I still don't think it's perfect, by the way. I think I could probably improve on this. Um, uh, this is uh, Rothko from scratch, <laughs> obviously. Uh, not difficult. This is, you know, I don't know whether you can see this, but it's a sauropod neck. Rothko is an extreme min minimalist. There's no figurative stuff in there. Um, basically, his brush technique is readily available in. Um, digital art uh, packages. So you can just use one of the existing oil painting brushes and you'll get pretty much what Jackson Pollock did, which is what I did for this one. And usually, you know, something like this, really, you're only looking at a couple of hours of work. Um, this one, Duckbill Dinosaurs, Lucian Freud. This is my one of my favorite pictures from the book because it produces the same effect that the original painting, which of course is of people, does. Um, Lucian Freud, famous for painting naked people that make you feel uncomfortable. So they're not, they feel like they're naked in front of you, not in a sexual way, but in a, in a psychological way, I guess. Um, and so it differs from earlier nudes, the history of nudes in art, in that they always feel presented to you in a way that isn't psychologically uncomfortable, whereas Lucian Freud was definitely trying to make you uncomfortable. And actually, I think these dinosaurs do make me uncomfortable. And I'm not entirely sure why, but I'm glad I painted it and I'm glad I tried because they do. It still works. His, um, his, his way of approaching art makes the transition into other sorts of animals, not just people. Naked dinosaurs can make us uncomfortable too. Um, so that's the end of my original talk. And the, um, the reason I was talking so much about the technique, how long it took to paint these pictures is because since the book came out, there's been a bit of a technological development to say the least. Now, this was obviously around before I brought the book out but um, it became a clear trajectory that we were, we were going somewhere with this, and that is AI art. And my book, Producing Pictures of Dinosaurs in Various Styles, which is my, well, you know, that's um, what I spent my entire painting career doing, trying to paint like, the great painters I admire, this skill has possibly become, well, commodified. You know, I think AI will possibly be able to do this pretty easily in the future. I just want to show you a couple of examples. I was hoping that I'd get something really good, but actually most of it's terrible. So, <laughs> The stuff on the left is stable diffusion. That's my prompt there. Triceratops painted in a cuba, cuba style, like Metzinger, dark. And there's my painting, which you saw earlier on the right. Um, you can see that it's not really close. Stable diffusion is, is producing garbage at the moment. I think the problem is it doesn't really know what cuba, cubism is. Sort of it does, but it seems to be trained on the wrong wrong sort of thing. I'm pretty sure it doesn't know what Metzinger is. Um, the other problem I had is that it really doesn't know many dinosaurs. And if you put in something it doesn't know, it just sort of fills in garbage. So I had to sort of stick with dinosaurs so that it knows, it clearly knows Triceratops, which is good. Um, and the next, image, which I think is a better attempt, is Tyrannosaurus painted in the style of Medigliani. I'm not sure it knows what Medigliani is, although that fourth image does 
look fairly close. So again, the AI on the on the left and my my painting on the right. Um, this is Dali 2. Dali 2 is better at painting um, historical styles. So I think what we have here, the Tyrannosaurus isn't all that bad, interestingly, but the artistic style is is still fairly weak. I, I don't know. This 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 is the stuff that makes me think that it, it is sort of heading in the right direction. The train trained on the right data, it will it will be quite interesting. Um, and actually, this final slide of mine, which is the prompt, is Ovi Raptor painted in the style of the Mir like girl with a pearl earring. Um, Dali loves go with the pearl earring. There's lots of examples of different things which are jammed into this painting. But what I find particularly interesting about this, clearly doesn't know what Ovi Raptor is, whatever. It's given us some sort of bird thing. All right. Um, but again, A on, A on the left, my version on the right. Um, it's better than mine, uh, which is a bit disturbing. The painting the the forgery of the painting is better than my attempt uh you know maybe that's my fault attempting to forge a vermeer in a few days but um yeah i think it's actually better than me and this is when i think it's the sorts of results you will get when you train the ai on the appropriate images rather carefully which they clearly have done with vermeer um but pro probably not with other other artists um the big hurdle for um, AI producing a book like this is that it just doesn't really know anything about dinosaurs. Um, so my my representations are head, head and shoulders above what it can do. But I think that might also be another just, it's got to have better training data. And um, I think that perhaps in the few, next few years, this this could be this could be given to it and it will understand dinosaurs at the moment it really only understands um it's better at portrait type things so legs and hands and stuff confuse it but i do believe they fixed the hand thing recently by just you know giving it better training data giving it a different model and i think that they'll probably be able to fix a lot of this stuff just by giving it better training data and better models of what is going on with anatomy so yeah that is actually the end i was kind of hoping to have a bit of discussion about um projects like this the outreach and how much this is going to be affected by technology in the future i i think it's kind of amazing that i brought it out just a few months before it became clear to me that this is the sort of thing that a computer could just basically do for me um, maybe I would need to modify things or whatever, but this could have saved me a lot of work if it's morally acceptable to do so, which is another question. So yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna end it there, and hopefully we can have a bit of discussion about that. Uh, thank you.